before I begin, I should say that uh, what I'm going to show you is a is a slideshow that it's, uh, I've been developing over a period of time, working uh, uh, for the past while at CG, and uh, there's some stuff, some of the stuff you may have seen uh, in terms of outside the box thinking uh, we put on the on the CG website, and uh, I've been doing some work uh, for the School of Public Policy at the University of Calgary, who. Um, who've seen a previous version of this, uh, this kind of lecture. Uh, let me give you uh, one disclaimer and uh, one thought. The disclaimer is uh, I have to apologize. I'm an economist. I was trained as an economist. <clears throat> and the best definition of an economist is someone who does not know what he's talking about and makes you feel bad about it. <laughs> and the disclaimer is something I'm reminded of that uh, Pedro Milan, former finan finance minister of Brazil, uh, said in a situation somewhat like this, where he had 20, 25 minutes to tell people everything he knows about what he's been working on, all the wisdom that he's, all the insights that he's developed over the past uh, years on this topic, and how is he supposed to convey all this, all this insight, all these points to a group like this in 20 or 25 minutes? And he asked his wife, and his wife said, it's very easy. Speak very slowly. <clears throat> anyway, uh, we're going to talk about uh, about climate change. So, ca can the G20 uh, save climate change? Well, that doesn't work. So, my storyline is is pretty simple. I'm going to give you some criteria for things getting on the, the G20 agenda. If you read the latest piece by Paul Heinbecker, you'll see that he and I disagree to some extent. Uh, I'm going to spend a few minutes on what the actual dilemma is uh, on climate change, uh, pointing out that we have to get down uh, to two tons per capita for emissions by 2050. Two tons per capita, we'll come to that. I'll spend a couple of minutes on what I think are uh, implausible and absolutely hopeless uh, approaches, which happen to be the approaches that are being uh, pursued now, which are binding targets for each country and fiscal transfers to help poorer countries deal with mitigation adaptations. I think it's, it's absolutely hopeless. <clears throat> uh, then I'll remind you of the McKinsey curve. Um, there are a lot of investments that we can make that are no regrets, that don't cost anything, that they actually make you money and at the same time simultaneously uh, help with the problem. <clears throat> and then <clears throat> my uh, package, uh, a dictators, a beneficent dictators package, and we'll deal with uh, inefficient fossil fuel subsidies, standards, R&D. <clears throat> LNG is a, an abbreviation for security of supply. And those are all inside the box. And then I want to talk to you uh, about sex, obesity, and women negotiators. So what are the criteria for putting something on, uh, on the G20 agenda? Bear in mind uh, that this will be the sixth meeting. There have been five of these G20 meetings already. A little later on, I'm going to show you a picture of uh, what the table looks like at each of them. Uh, you're not going to get something on the agenda unless there's a major implication for every country around the table. There's got to be some sort of a need for collective action. <clears throat> I believe you need, an, you need, uh, you need to be in, in a crisis situation. Uh, I think what's, what's involved here at this stage of its life, the G20 is more like a fire brigade. It's, uh, it's not the global steering committee. It's not, it's not yet in shape to be uh, the committee to save the world. Um, I think the G20 has to be the last resort. If there's some other organization who's, which is dealing with the, the problem or the issue at hand, and if that organization has any uh, reasonable chance of fixing it, then there's going to be a lot of voices claiming, leave it with that organization. Don't uh, lift it. Don't, don't uh, steal it. And most important, um, you're never going to get anything on the agenda of the G20 unless there's some prospect for success. 
uh, all the political operators around the leaders are not going to allow something to go on the agenda if the discussion is uh, doomed to, uh, to fail. And that means that you have to be able to justify the, the belief that there's a really a workable win-win-win outcome uh, for G20 countries. So um, this is supposed to be a lunch and learn session, so I, I, I inserted two cartoons which are generic, which can be used in any, uh, in any uh, presentation you may be preparing. And this is one of them uh, to justify the, you know, the uh, immediate uh, crisis situation, the, the criterion for crises. So we've got a problem. I think, I think uh, <clears throat> generally speaking, we can argue that, that uh, most of the criteria are going to be met. The issue is going to be shoehorning this item onto the agenda where we already have a legacy of, uh, of many, many issues that are already on the agenda. Uh, all of the reports uh, on the balanced, uh, on, on the framework for balanced growth the issues surrounding currency wars, <clears throat> uh, the Koreans put development and the financial safety net on the agenda. Uh, each summit provides invitations to different international organizations or to groups of ministers or they formulate working groups of officials and they commission them, they, they give them remits, they tell them to, to come back at the next meeting with a report on X or Y. And there are on average about 10 or 12 of these. And if you go through the Seoul Declaration, you'll see there's a long, long list of, uh, of studies that have been called for to come, come in. So the agenda is already, uh, already pretty packed. But I think the climate change area, <coughs> whoops, I missed one, <coughs> is, is one of them. This is a situation on, uh, on carbon dioxide emissions. I think April should be out pretty soon, but you, you can see the, the trend is clear and we're at, uh, you know, we're approaching 400 and we'll, uh, we'll be hitting 450 pretty soon. Can you see that at the far end of the room? <clears throat> so what does 450 uh, mean? The general consensus of the scientists is that despite all the uncertainties, uh, we should probably avoid anything more than a two degree temperature increase by 2050, say. And the only way we're going to do that, they say, is to try and limit uh, the concentration of gases to 450 parts per million. But there's no certainty about these things. There's all kinds of uh, things that people, dimensions that people don't understand about the capacity of forests and and oceans to, uh, to act as effective sinks to absorb carbon dioxide. We don't know what the extent of forest coverage is going to be in 2050. Um, so the way they frame it is in terms of probabilities. And they basically argue that, look, uh, prudence tells you that, you, you know, if you limit it to 450 parts per million, then we'll, uh, we have a 50-50 chance uh, of, of not exceeding two degrees. Now, if you're an alarmist and you really think that two degrees, let's say you have uh, a seashore property uh, and you want to leave it to your great-grandchildren, uh, you're, you're going to want to be in the 350 camp. And there's actually a, an NGO and a whole movement in the website called 350 Now that argues we should be at 350. 350 should be the target, not 450. And recall, we're already well, well over 390. Uh, 350 still leads a 30% chance of exceeding two degrees. So if we're going to get to 450, what do we have to do? These are the, uh, the tracks for, uh, for the world and for divided by, by, development, uh, by developed and developing countries on uh, how emissions per capita have to fall. So today for the developed world, we're up at, uh, at 14 tons per capita. So if you believe the two degrees is a target, and that's been enshrined in all kinds of uh, world leaders' declarations and at the UN and summits. Everybody agrees with two degrees, that's the target, leads to 450 parts per million. To do that, we've got to get down 
to two tons per capita by 2050. And that's where we are now. This is the latest I could find for, for this range of countries. But you can see we're at, uh, at well over, uh, over 16. We've got to move to two. <clears throat> the guy who's uh, founded uh, the footprint, global footprint uh, methodology, Mathis uh, Wackernagel, he has a neat quote, <clears throat> politicians are caught in a dilemma between political suicide and ecological suicide. You know, if you're a politician, it's very, very difficult. Uh, to put your reputation and your career on the line for this issue. And here I've given you a list of some of the reasons why it's difficult to orchestrate essential, uh, the, the international coordination that would be essential. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so I want to, I, I start from the premise that it's Pollyannish, it's naive to think that there's ever going to be an agreement to, uh, the, or if there's ever going to be action to honor the agreement to give $100 billion a year by 2020 to poor countries. That's what the uh, Copenhagen uh, agreement reinforced uh, in Cancun was, $100 million a year by 2020 to help poor countries with, uh, with mitigation and adaptation. <clears throat> if you think about what that means uh, for Canada, we usually contribute, depending on the International Devel uh, Development Bank, the World Bank, or uh, UN agency, we usually contribute 4 or 5 percent, uh, sometimes as much as 7 percent of the total world subscription. The Canadian portion is, f is you know, 4 percent. So imagine us, uh, what's the prospect of a Canadian government coming up with an extra $4 billion a year, per year, to transfer to China and India and Brazil and other countries uh, to help them with climate change. I don't think it's going to happen in Canada, but I'm a, I'd say I don't think it's going to happen in Canada. I know it's not going to happen in the United States. You know, the, the Congress will never let it happen. And I'm equally pessimistic about uh, binding targets. So I, I start from the premise and I'm, I'm going to end up telling you I'm quite optimistic, but I start from the premise that these approaches are not the way uh, to resolve the problem. Now, th this is the McKinsey cost curve. It was done for Vattenfall's uh, foundation in, uh, in Sweden. It's been published uh, quite a few places. It's an attempt to try and figure out what the different uh, initiatives might be, the different uh, elements might be, what they would cost to, uh, <coughs> to abate emissions. And the point is that the stuff on the left-hand side, colored yellow and orange, if you do any of those things, uh, and there's a, you can't see all of them because, uh, I mean, uh, the print would be too small. But if you, if you look this up, you'll see there's about 20 different initiatives where you actually save money. It's the, the, the rate of return over time it's, uh, is positive. It's a, it's a smart investment. You make money and abate uh, uh, emissions at the same time. So there's a whole bunch of things that should be done just for our own sake, and I call them no regrets strategies. Now the problem with, with analyses like this is it involves statistics, and as you know, statistics are like sausages. You like them better if you don't know what's in them. Um, but the basic point is there are a lot of things that are, are very sensible to do. It's sensible to invest in insulating your home. Uh, we save money over time. <clears throat> These are the, the photographs of, uh, of the five G20 summits to, to date. Uh, top left hand side is the first one Bush called in Washington. Uh, the top right hand one uh, is Pittsburgh, uh, the third one. Uh, the third one's up on the top right-hand side. Uh, then we have the London uh, G20 summit, and then Toronto and, uh, and Seoul. And I think what you want to do is, uh, 
before you suggest that something should go on the G20 agenda, is you want to stare at those pictures for a little while. Because it'll come, you'll come to realize that virtually nothing of any substance is going to be decided in a two-day meeting with 50, 40, 50 egos sitting around the table that don't even speak the same language. So what that means is that stuff is going to have to be done well in advance. There's going to have to be a, 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 a very systematic preparatory process uh, with many meetings beforehand. And a group like this can ratify the outcome of that negotiation process. The useful thing about the G20 is that it can put together a, a, a grand bargain. <clears throat> it can put together a package where it takes uh, activities or initiatives in distinct areas and package them together so that any particular country may lose or have find it very, very costly to accept one or two of the elements but the calculation would be that, no, no, we're big winners on some of the others. So the question is, can we put together a package of elements? Before we construct the package, uh, the, in addition to whatever is useful on that McKinsey curve, whatever is the no regrets on the McKinsey curve, the next question is, well, what about inefficient fossil fuel subsidies? At the Pittsburgh G20 summit, they commissioned the World Bank, uh, the, uh, uh, the International Energy Agency, and the OECD to do a study which was submitted in Toronto and they came up with these uh, these particular findings. There's a lot of things that governments in each country are doing that are foolish in their own right uh, with respect to subsidizing fossil fuel. There's no question there are political ramifications. Uh, there's internal winner-loser calculuses that have to be made, but uh, in terms of the gross national interest of every G20 country, there's a lot that can be done in terms of the impact of removing inefficient fossil fuel subsidies, which would result in a lot of abatement. Okay, <clears throat> so now the question is, with respect to the G20, beyond no regrets and beyond inefficient fossil fuel subsidies, what can be done? So. My, the usual construct uh, that I like to, uh, like to use is to pretend that, uh, pretend you're in charge. You're the boss. Uh, pr pretend there's a, uni you know, a unified, unitary world government and you're the beneficent dictator. Fortunately, we got Tom. Uh, he's very wise. Uh, it's a unified, unitary state, but it's federal, you know, so we, we still have Quebec, still has a provincial government, we still have a Chinese government, we still have an American government, so the results of his decision are going to have to, uh, to a large extent, re recognize that there are uh, regional sensitivities and national sensitivities of different governments. So my suggestion is that there are three things that I call inside the box solutions that can be done that uh, are win, can be characterized and negotiated as win, 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 where there are no losers. And then I want to talk to you about the really interesting stuff, sex, obesity, and women, which are three outside the box approaches that the G20 could, uh, could undertake. So the first thing is standards enforced by border tax adjustments. The G20 could decide that for the real high emitting industries in 2018 or 2020, there are going to be some extraordinarily stringent standards. The G20 could agree to do that. It makes sense for them because it turns out that when you invest in these efficient, high tech, new industries, uh, it usually is no regrets. But impose the standard now making industry understand there's, certain, there's certainty coming in 2018 or 2020, and then any products that don't meet those standards after that point in time, we're going to change the WTO rules so that there'll be tariffs imposed on people who don't meet those standards. Guaranteed that would work. 
the next thing uh, that the G20 could do is build on a bunch of successful models for international research collaboration. What's required is we have to mobilize a lot of uh, research where the results are sort of analogous to uh, what's, what's been negotiated to some extent on prescription drugs. We need royalty-free products. We need public money going into R&D where the results are royalty-free, you know, patent-free, uh, universally available results. It's going to be a lot easier to convince the United States to put five or ten billion dollars into a research operation where the labs are going to be in the U.S. even if the patents are, are free, uh, are worldwide available, than it is to convince the U.S. Congress to come up with five or ten billion dollars to give to the Chinese and the Indians. This would work. And we have a half a dozen models, some of them in the energy area, where uh, we've seen how to set it up institutionally. The International Energy Agency has an a set of arrangements uh, for security of supply in case there's a, another embargo on oil by the Persian Gulf or an OPEC problem. Uh, we've got to get China into that system. We have to have, uh, this is a confidence building uh, uh, measure. We have to get um, in investment in infrastructure so that the, nat the natural gas market worldwide becomes uh, a mirror image of, uh, of the oil market. At the present time, uh, see if Tom was beneficent dictator, think of what the pipeline network would be in the world. It would be much more efficient than the existing set of pipelines. If there were fewer political constraints on where pipelines could go, there'd be a much different distribution system. If you had LNG uh, plants, and LNG uh, fleets in 2020 uh, all over the world with a very mobile market, you would end up displacing a tremendous amount of dirty coal. There's problems with uh, some of this because people worry that the U.S. is going to become a, um, a net exporter of this stuff because there's so much shale gas and there are, there are serious environmental consequences in, in finding the, uh, some of this unconventional sh uh, gas and shale oil and shale systems, but there's, there's enough uh, conventional uh, natural gas to, to justify uh, investment in this stuff. So and this is the other generic cartoon you can use in any, in any presentation. Um, so I promised, uh, the only reason I have 20 people here, so as I promised, um, the word must go out, I wanted to talk about sex. Um, the problem we have is population. We got, we got too many people. The median forecast for uh, 2050, and remember we were talking two tons per person in 2050 is what we have to get down to to meet that 450 parts per million target, which as I reminded you, some people think is a little too risky. So nine billion people. So let's do some arithmetic. At least here I don't have to give the, the caveat in, in Calgary I had to explain the arithmetic because they don't take math, a lot of the Calgary students, but is there anybody here that has any trouble with this arithmetic? Max? You're a verbal guy. Okay, two degrees, uh, 450 parts per million. When they do the trajectories, that meant that the total emissions in 2050 can only be 18 billion tons. If you have 9 billion people, it's two tons per capita. Now, if you think about uh, you know, that McKinsey curve or so. We're up at 16 or 17 or 18 tons per capita. You know, the first couple of tons we can get rid of and reduce by those no regrets strategies. And then we would invest in some cheap stuff. You know, and we would do the most inexpensive investments to cut back and we might make a couple of lifestyle changes. But the toughest and most expensive ton per capita to reduce is going to be 
to go from three to two. It's gonna be a lot cheaper to go from 16 to 15 than it is from 10 to nine, but the toughest and most expensive one is to go from three to two. But one way to get to, to three, to stay at three and not have to go to two, is if we could end up with six billion people. If there were only six billion people in 20, uh, 2050, then they'd be entitled to three tons per capita and we would not have to make that last real expensive cut. What's the best uh, approach to population control? It's not economic growth, as some people will tell you. It's not uh, the degree of urbanization. They're definitely correlated. I should tell you something later about correlations. <clears throat> we'll see how much time we have. Uh, the number one most important climate change policy should be secondary education for women. Fertility rates fall dramatically with education. So rather than going to China and India and Brazil and telling them, hey, you know, we want you to uh, cut your emissions, we're, we're in the end going to get to the same, same outcome by telling them, look, it's in your interest to educate uh, women to the secondary levels. And as a byproduct, we'll be solving the climate change thing. There'll be a lot of other extraordinarily positive uh, dimensions. Second, uh, lifestyle. There's a lot of uh, information about, uh, about lifestyle, obesity, and health costs. I don't know if you, if you read the lifestyle section of the papers. You know, people are worried about long-term health care costs. Uh, and just the general health of the population because of obesity. My second climate change outside the box policy is we gotta find some way uh, to get people to lose weight. I found this lovely article in the Journal of Epidemiology that came up with these statistics. And if you think about it, you know, they weigh our luggage <laughs> on planes. You know why? Well, it takes more fuel to move the luggage, more emissions. So the second element's got to be uh, a G20 argument on uh, not uh, because it's a climate change policy. They should be worried about the health care costs. So education, secondary education of women, health, you know, if you worry about your long-term fiscal consequences for uh, the consequences of uh, lifestyles on your, on your health expenditures, we gotta do something about this, and there are tremendous secondary benefits. Third is, uh, is women. There's this MIT uh, research that demonstrates that the, the effectiveness of a group decision-making process is not based on the total no, uh, amount of IQ in the room. Sorry, guys. There's another set of research on Fortune 500 companies. All the women's pictures in the background here are Fortune 500 uh, executives. Now, the UN Secretary General last year appointed a, uh, a panel, a high-level panel on climate change financing. 20 people, one woman. What do you think it's gonna, its success prospects are? So my third and final outside the box uh, suggestion uh, you know, if, if we're serious about it, then the G20 could easily resolve, in addition to doing a lot more about uh, secondary education for women, and in addition to, uh, to worrying about uh, lifestyles in terms of obesity and health, and from the perspective of defending their uh, fiscal situation on health, they should start sending women to do the job. And if Tom was in charge, that's what would happen. Thank you for your attention.